Um, so yeah, so obviously most of you here, why why power factor correction? Why is this something you should be looking at? There's a few reasons why why sites implement power factor correction. Um, the first one and the main one is really to reduce your electricity demand uh, on site and reduce costs. Um, so it's something, um, yeah, something that, that people look at um, to reduce the, the demand component of, of charges on your electricity bills, which is something we'll I'll go into a bit more detail later on. Um, there are some other like add-on benefits, such as improves the, the the life of your equipment, um, particularly large motors and um, other large loads. It reduces the the current to those loads, so prolongs their life. Um, it's also uh, depending on where you are, Australia, particularly. Um, yeah, there's most most states and territories have regulatory code codes that you need to comply with. Um, often they're not too rigorously enforced, but um, there are minimum requirements for power factor for sites. So depending on um, the size of your, your supply voltage, the kilowatts that come to your site, um, and the size of your, your demand on site, uh, there's different requirements. So from a minimum to around 0.75 power factor, up to very large loads on um, large transformers, we require 0.98. Um, so there's a range there. Typically, I mean, generally 0.8 is the minimum. Um, if you're getting getting really low, then you may remove your requirements to, to improve that. Um, and the final one, which which kind of comes up when people are looking at expanding capacity for sites, uh, is that improving your power factor correction can be a cheap way to to prolong that or avoid that. So you can improve your power factor correction and avoid installing new um, transformers or other other electrical equipment to to, to expand your site if you're adding on new facilities um, can be a cheap way to, to facilitate that. Um, all right, so I'll run through some quick definitions of the power factor. Um, we'll kind of, I'll mention as we go through the, the presentation. Um, so hopefully these aren't too technical with people, but um, yeah, we can kind of go into them in a bit more detail. Uh, so there's three main types of power um, that we talk about when we're looking at power factor correction. But the main one, or the one that you really care about the most, is the active power, um, and that's that's the real or the actual power. And this is kind of is watts or kilowatts. So you'll you may have um, motors that are rated to kilowatts or um, yeah, different bits of plant that, that have a, an, an active power rating, and that's what the, the equipment actually uses and needs to use um, to, to operate effectively. Um, the reactive power is um, it's required to some degree. You need at least a little bit to, to maintain the electromagnetic field for, for, for equipment, but generally this is um, it's, it's the power that's kind of stored and released throughout the system. Um, and it's, yeah, it's measured in um, volt amp uh, so VARs or KVARs, um, and it's it's typically beyond that minimum bit. It's it's undesirable, and that's what we're trying to minimise. Um, and the third one is the the apparent power, and so that's um, it's the, the product of when you're looking at like the um, the power and the currents. Um, it's measured in volt amps. Um, and you can see there that that power triangle, um, that little um, diagram there kind of explains the relationship between the three. So you have the, the real power at the bottom there, um, the reactive power on the, the right hand side, and the apparent power is it's not necessarily the sum of the two, but it's um, if you can remember back to your trigonometry, it's um, it's, the, it's the hypotenuse of that triangle, um, and that's the one where yeah. So trying to minimise the reactive power just so that apparent power is is lower. Um, and that's the, the relationship between the two there, the active and reactive, is, is the power factor. So it's the, the ratio of the active to the, react, to the apparent power. Um, this is the, the key definition for us there. Um, and so what we're, what we're trying to achieve ideally is, a, is the power factor of one. So it's a unity between the, the voltage and the current. Um, if you've got a typical resistive alternating current circuit, um, so, for example, if you cut at home, if you just got a, a toaster as your only load in your house, that's 
for a purely resistive load, so it's going to have a, a power factor of one. Um, but so we get issues arising when we, we have conductive or inductive loads on um, on on site. So the, the main main loads we're seeing is inductive loads, and they're um, uh, motors is the most common one we see of those, but there's a range of other inductive loads. Um, some inductive loads, things like fluorescent lights, actually are slightly conductive. Um, and so what these loads do is they, yeah, they um, result in a bit of a time difference between the, the current and the voltage waveforms. Um, so you can see see there that on that, that diagram there. So that's we refer to these as when like the current's lagging or leading the voltage. Um, and so when there's when there's loads on the um, on the conductive or inductive loads and the power factor is less than one, then we refer to them the voltage and current as being out of phase. Um, and so yeah, you can see they're just a pretty simple um, schematic of, of that. So the the more they are out of phase, the higher the power factor. Um, and so what we look to do then is with power factor correction is to, to realign the, the phases, to realign the, the voltage and current, sorry. Um, so we look at um, adding in power factor correction. So we do that. There's two types of power factor correction, um, so active and passive. Depending on depending on the type of loads you have, um, you, you look at, at either system. So if it's just a simple linear load, um, you just use passive power factor correction, which is just banks of um, capacitors or inductors, but yeah, almost always it's, it's capacitor banks. Um, but if you have slightly more complicated systems with um, uh, harmonics in there, which um, instead of just putting the, those two waveforms out of sync, they kind of put, they make the, the waveforms um, a really funny shape, so then we can then distorts those um, the waveforms. We use um, active power factor correction which kind of uh, cleans up the, the waveforms um, and then uh, gets them back together. And so, um, yeah, the, the power factor, the passive is what we see. Typically it's, a, um, it's cheaper, typically cheaper and um, not quite as effective as the asset active, but generally for, for most um, manufacturing sites or production sites, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's enough for us. Um, so what we're doing with this power factor correction is we're really just bringing those two, um, the voltage and current together, so they're back in line and we're getting the optimum um, efficiency from our, our power supply. Um, so in other words, um, in case that was a bit too technical, um, you can kind of imagine this is the, using a, a beer analogy. So often you're paying, you pay, you buy a beer at the bar and you get, you get beer, which is the kilowatt, uh, Bit there, and you also get the foam or the head of the beer, which is the KBAR. Um, so you pay for the whole lot, but you'd rather just have more of the beer than um, the head. So um, we look to kind of minimise that the, the foam section, um, maximise the amount of beer in our glass. 